Hi everybody, welcome to JD's Journeys. My name is JD and this is part two of my 300 subscriber special. If you haven't seen part one, please go up here and click on the info card. That'll take you to the first part where you'll see two stories. Now, in this video, we're going to finish off with three stories about my life in Japan, and they are some of the most exciting ones. So I hope you enjoy it. Also, please keep in mind the question that I asked in the first question. Do you think I should write a book about my life in Japan? So let me know in the comment section below after you watch the rest of this video. And, of course, if you want to see more videos like this, then please please give me some thumbs up and subscribe. So let's get on with the other three stories. My third story actually took place this year. Now, this is something a lot of people would want to do when they go to Japan, and that is experience Japanese hot springs. And I went with my wife's family to uh, Izu Peninsula, and there's this hot spring resort that we stayed at that had amazing views, amazing hot springs, and it was just plain amazing. So we spent one night and we had booked a regular room, but they upgraded us to one of the big suites. That was absolutely incredible. I loved it. And uh, just the feeling, the atmosphere of being there was amazing. The hot springs. Uh, I went to the hot springs, I believe, three times. Uh, once before dinner, once before going to bed, and once the following morning. Now, this is the main hot spring. There was also uh, a private hot spring. You could book this for about an hour, and we went in there. So it was my wife, daughter, and I who were in there for a little while. And that was great. The view from there is amazing. It's totally private. Ocean view. Now, keep in mind, this is in March, so it's pretty chilly out. But when you're in the water, you don't care about that. That was incredible. But there is another hot spring that was near there. We had to walk down the street for about five minutes, wearing our yukatas. And... When we got there, uh, we had to pay. No, we didn't have to pay. Uh, since we were staying at the hotel, we could get in for free. Uh, other people would have to pay to get in. Now, this is right on the beach. This, this is a, a natural hot spring that's just right there on the beach. And it's mixed. So men and women are in there together. So yes, I experienced a mixed hot spring naked with a bunch of men and women. Of course, most of them were elderly. <laughs> but just experiencing the hot spring was amazing. And I did get a lot of video for this. Of course, not inside the springs themselves. That would have been awkward. Naked people in there, no. But of the resort itself, yes, I got video. And that will eventually make its way onto this channel in A Taste of Japan. It's one of the last ones, so it'll be a while. But subscribe, and you will see it eventually. And my next positive story is going back to 2010. I decided that year I was going to attend every sumo tournament that was held in Tokyo that year. And there are three sumo tournaments in Tokyo, and there are three outside of Tokyo. So I went in January, May, and September, I believe, yeah. So during one of them, actually I believe it was the January one, this, is, this was uh, Asa Shoryu's final tournament before he retired. Uh, he's considered one of the best ever. Of course, he's been eclipsed by Hakuho, who's, who's a current Yokozuna. Um, but it was very interesting watching it. There's a lot of downtime between the matches, so it's kind of quiet. Uh, it's not very exciting early on. It's not until you get to the 
the higher ranks, the, the really good expert professionals, where it gets packed, it's full. And I've, uh, I've seen someone doing cheerleading. I've seen uh, a few sumo wrestlers walking in front of me. And probably my highlight was just coming back from getting myself some lunch. I see this giant man walking, uh, walking there wearing this blue jumpsuit. And I thought, oh, that's a sumo wrestler. So I just sped up so I could see if I could recognize him. And I did. He's a former Yokozuna, Musashi Maru. Uh, he is a huge guy. He, he achieved the top rank. He's from Hawaii, actually. So I know I knew he could speak English. So I just decided, ah, hello, uh, you're Musashi Maru. Nice to meet you. And he said, oh, nice to meet you. Uh, no, he didn't. Sorry. I said, how are you? And he said, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> and the thing is, he seems like a nice guy. But yeah, that was my experience with watching Sumo. I watched it three times and I really enjoyed it. I haven't been watching much. Well, living in Canada, I can't watch it anymore. But I do keep track of how well they do. And my final story for you is March 11th, 2011. That is the date of the great Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. Uh, I was in Yokohama at the time when it happened. I was teaching a lesson. And then the whole building started to shake violently. I was almost finished the lesson. It was about 2.46 p.m. So I remember exactly what time it happened. And yeah, we, as soon as we could, we evacuated the building. It wasn't a very, it wasn't a very new building. And uh, we waited outside. Now, I should say that the shaking happened for about three minutes. It was really long. It was difficult to walk and stand up. It was absolutely incredible. I'd never felt anything like it before. And this was the fourth largest earthquake in recorded history, or recorded earthquake. And uh, yeah, there was actually very little damage where I lived. The shaking was quite violent, but not much damage at all. Uh, there were some places where there was liquefaction. Roads were cracked, buildings were cracked, but these were all very easily repaired. And uh, so... There were some aftershocks, some powerful aftershocks during that day, and we were stuck at work. We couldn't go home. Trains were stopped. I had no idea how I was going to get home. Um, so stayed there until evening. It was around 8 or 8.30 p.m., and finally the train started going. So I made my way home. My wife had already uh, arrived at home. She had to walk home from work. But she found that uh, all the doors inside the apartment were open. They'd, they'd been moving. Uh, the dog was sleeping. <laughs> well, he, he was deaf and blind. He probably just didn't really know what was going on and fell asleep. And uh, yeah, that's not where the story ends. Basically, after that, for the next two to three weeks, there were... Uh, gasoline shortages, there were, there was, uh, food shortages, we, we had difficulty finding any food, there's toilet paper shortages, we couldn't find any, and, uh, we spent many of our evenings eating out, because supermarkets were empty, restaurants were still getting food, because they had special deliveries, but they were on reduced menus, so we could only choose a certain amount of things. So it was a very interesting situation. Uh, you'd, you'd think, I, I just remember, there was a big earthquake in Los Angeles and there was a huge amount of looting. But in Japan, it was a, a very unusual calm. Like people, of course, were afraid. They were, 
I'm sure people were, uh, did panic, but people just calmly accepted that this was happening and they just waited everything out and they helped. They, they did as much as they could to help each other. Um, there were some negative things that happened, like people were hoarding. There was one person who was hoarding toothbrushes. They went in there and bought a, about a hundred toothbrushes. What is the point of that? It's not the end of the world. Uh, but there were just some stupid things that happened. There were aftershocks for weeks. Like we would be eating out and there's an, there's an aftershock. And we got so used to them, at least I did. And they were pretty strong ones too. But was I afraid? Hmm, a bit, yeah. I think the adrenaline had me more like uh, thinking, this is incredible. <laughs> Just amazing more than anything. But uh, seeing what was happening in northeastern Japan with the tsunami, that was, that was awful. Just watching the footage of the tsunami, uh, it just, it was just unbelievable. I, it just felt surreal, I would say. Of course, during this whole thing, uh, cell phones were unusable. Uh, we couldn't connect with anything. However, I found that my data was working. Uh, so I was able to go on Facebook and tell everyone I'm fine. So I had a connection to the rest of the world. And uh, also all that stuff with uh, the nuclear power plant, uh, where I was, we were, we were fine. There was no problem there. Uh, it's about uh, uh, between two and 300 kilometers away. So yeah, no problem where we were. So that was my experience with one of the world's largest earthquakes. Not fun, but it was exhilarating. So if you made it through this video all the way to here, thank you for watching. I really mean it. And thank you for all my subscribers uh, subscribing to me. Now, did you think about the question? What do you think? Should I write a book about it? Let me know in the comment section below. Also, if you like this video, give me a big thumbs up and please subscribe. You'll get to see more things about books, Japan, and of course, Star Trek too. And check out these two videos. I'm sure you'll like them. So thank you for going on this journey to Japan with me. See you in the next video.